Welcome to Have You Heard, where we talk about issues at the intersection of agriculture and engineering. Let's get started. Here are your hosts, Morgan Hayes and Josh Jackson. Welcome. This is the Have You Heard podcast. It's episode number uh, 17. Today we're going to start our show with what's happening on the farms this week. And then we're going to discuss uh, feed, uh, weaning into a barn, which is my approach to weaning. I'm Morgan Hayes. I'm an assistant professor in the Biosystems and Ag Engineering Department at the University of Kentucky. And a in my personal life, uh, I farm in Boyle County, Kentucky with my husband. We have a commercial cattle and hay operation. I'm Josh Jackson. I farm in Mercer County. I'm assistant professor in agriculture and biosystem engineering, focusing on precision livestock farming. And in Mercer County, we, we focus on hay production and raising retro Angus cattle. Hey, Josh. So it's been an interesting week. What have you been handling up on your farm this week? So this weekend, we got our skid steer back. It's done from, the sh- it's back from the shop. So we went ahead and cleaned out our hay feeder. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we went ahead and also warmed our calves and weighed them again. So, and then gave them, if they needed their second round of black leg or shots, we went ahead and gave those to them. So, um, and then just put out some hay to general maintenance, things on fence line. So, regular weekend for us. How about you, Morgan? Yeah, sort of similar. Pretty, pretty low-key weekend. We did a lot of feeding. Uh, my husband's gone again this week. I feel like I say that a lot. It's not always the case. It just happens to be a busy season for travel. So, um, just making sure that my feeding isn't so time-consuming that I can't handle it on a daily basis. We are uh, into our calving season. We are officially on calf watch now. We have had the first two of 35 that we're expecting um, on our spring herd. Um, And that is enough of a time commitment for me. Um, We also have those calves that we weaned uh, about a week and a half ago uh, that I have to get fed in the barn every night and keep a good eye on. And then a couple steers that we're holding back and feeding um, the process later this year. So a bunch of animals just needed feed and water and just general management over the weekend. We did get one of our tractors. I said that we had a starter issue that is a functional tractor again, which is good. Every time you get one tractor running, you know, something <laughs> else will break, but that's one less uh, repair that we have currently. Okay. It's always a plus. Hey, anytime. Get, get stuff knocked out. Yeah. Yeah. Hay season's almost upon us. It is almost upon us. And we're almost done with um, hay deliveries for the year. We have a few more to do probably, but for the most part, all of our hay is either someone's coming to pick it up or it's already made it out the door, which is a big deal. We're just sort of kind of watching what the hay market is doing right now. Asher's starting to green up a little bit for you guys. It is for us, but uh, I don't know how you guys are. Yep, it's starting to green up. Um, it's still March. Uh, I'm not holding my breath that we're going to get fully established grasses in the next week or two, but our plan is at least for our least piece of land in early April to start using some of that grass in combination with still feeding hay to make sure we don't overgraze anything. But um, animals are certainly seeing the green grass and they are less inclined to eat the hay right now. And it is obvious that that's occurring. We're seeing our bale consumption is going down slightly. Yep, we're seeing the same thing. <clears throat> also, we weaned our fall group, so that's an obvious reduction in hay demand for about half of our herd because they're no longer in lactation. Our spring herd is going to come into lactation, but nothing has picked up yet on their hay consumption. And likely we have another two or three weeks before enough animals are into milk at a heavy enough rate that we're going to see any pickup in energy requirements. And whether or not they're going to be willing to take hay to get that energy or not is, uh, well, so, honestly, they will because we're not turning them out until, at least for a month until we get a good portion of our, our calves on the ground. Okay, that makes sense. And so uh, shifting gears back to what we talked about originally, so you're weaning some calves. So that's, you know, you talked about having your spring group coming along, but, you know, those fall groups, taking care of them. What is your goal with you do barn weaning? What is your goal with barn weaning? Why do you use it? So we wean into an existing dairy barn that's on a a farm that I I purchased a few years ago. And we wean into the barn for two reasons. Um, This time, all of the calves came off of one farm, but often we have two groups, a group of heifers that are being managed separately from our cows. uh, And they calve 
sometimes in two different spots. So one reason that we wean into the barn is because that way we can have all of our calves in one spot when they wean. It makes management a little bit easier on that group. The second reason is we have a huge feed trough. It's an old silage feeding style, but we actually have drops so that we put in a pelleted feed in front of them. But there's enough space that everyone has a lot of access for feed, as well as a lot of access for fresh hay. Um, so the barn is a very contained space. Uh, it's very controlled. There's not a lot of ways for them to escape. I told you that one got out, and that that does happen occasionally. They'll make it through feed, feed bunk, and then they'll walk yeah. out. But everything now has pretty tight wire meshes <laughs> on the bottom to keep them from sneaking out under any other fences after that. So um, it is a fairly contained space to wean them. They have already seen feed, and certainly in the fall group, they've seen a lot of hay. So there's really no problem training them to eat either of those two things. Um, but it gets us eyes on them really well. We have a working facility attached, so if we do have anything that's not doing well, we can get them up quickly. Um, and the other real benefit to, to weaning in the barn is that's where they're going to stay until we sell them. Okay. Um, they might get a sacrifice lot, a small lot, to get them a little more space and exercise once we know that they're on feet good and they will come. Uh, but until that happens, they are locked on a concrete uh, pad area that can be scraped off. You mentioned how to drop. Is that automatic or is it controlled by it, lever or like, you know, manually controlled? Or? It has a lever on it. We do manually control it and we can adjust um, feed going through the drops. This is more like a system that you'd see in a swine or a poultry farm where there's um, a weighted uh, it's, I say weighted. It's it's actually an adjustment based upon the the size of the the drop itself, the plastic container that holds the feed. Um, but we can adjust how much we fill it based upon how much we want, anywhere from two to ten pounds on any of the drops in the system. And we have enough that we could, in theory, feed sixty animals at a hmm. pretty heavy size twice a day and put full feed in front of them to put a little over one and a half percent of body weight at them in feed if we wanted to. Okay. We never go quite that aggressive. We don't go one and a half or two percent. We're not pushing our animals typically in the barn that much, mainly because we keep heifers out of that group and we are not trying to get that kind of weight gain. We're just trying to get them on feed, eating well. Uh, so when they go somewhere else, they're already very comfortable with eating at a bunk, managing that. How, how do your cows do with this system? Are they any problems challenging your fences, or are they um, generally fine? Cows and heifers, I guess, both. Are... Cows are usually pretty good. Um, I've got one heifer that is bawling a little bit still. Um, but to be fair, she was by herself, and now she's in with the group because mm. she was she actually milked very heavy, and she needed a little additional feed. So she had been isolated, and now she's in with a new group. So she had two stressors happening at once. She weaned a calf and she got introduced to new cows and um, she'd already been introduced to them, but reintroduction to those cows. And so she doesn't seem to be handling it particularly well. Uh, and I don't actually like putting two stressors together like that. But once the calf came out, she had to go in with a group because leaving Management. her isolated was also an unacceptable option. Not really healthy for cows to be alone. So She's the only one that hasn't hinged, but not going through fences, just still a little bit of bawling. Everything else bawled for about two days on her cows and then uh, stopped bawling. Okay. I will say that I generally I find that the cows, whether or not they get nose to nose, don't seem as stressed about that. Most of our cows, because we never wean before six months. Okay. Until our group has an average birth dates of six months we don't wean if we think we have anything that's really far out from that six months like it's a, a full month or five or six weeks past there we might leave that calf on even a little bit longer okay i know you wean a little bit earlier than that but since we wean at six months we don't tend to have a lot of problem with our cows not accepting the weaning process okay they generally do fine though yeah i don't have a, i don't really have a lot of concerns about them being stressed, I think heifers may be a little bit more surprised by the weaning process in general, but I haven't had anything really push a fence in a way that concerned me. All right. Well, that's good. And they'll walk in. I guess they still walk the fence line somewhat. Yeah, they do. They walk the fence. Um, in general, they walk the fence where the calves left. So the calves got pushed up into a small lot and then 
and then pushed out, but they actually got caught in the lot where the water tank is, so they would naturally be up there anyway. So when they come up for water the first couple days, they'll ball as they walk to the water to the water tank, and then they'll go back out to hay. But I haven't seen, other than maybe a 12, maybe a 24-hour reduction in hay intake, it hasn't really been reduced at all in those first couple days. And you vaccinate prior to uh, weaning. We right. have had two rounds of vaccine and everything prior to, and we will give a third round here in the next week or so, once we have at least two weeks post weaning, and we know that they're on feed good. And if we saw any sort of disease, this is when we would also give any sort of, if we, had, if we saw anything that we were concerned about, we would treat it if we hadn't already treated it. So any sort of antibiotics be given. Exactly. Um, but I don't have anything that is showing any signs of real distress. So they're going to get vaccinations likely this weekend. Although the weather looks maybe a little bit dicey, I probably won't push them up if it's really cold and wet. I will wait for a more appropriate day to do it. But, you know, we're not trying to give vaccines when they're already stressed. Right. It's, it's not a particularly effective way to give them. So we can usually comfortably wait a couple of weeks post weaning because they've already had two rounds. This is their third round. Although it is a it is a dead vaccine. This is not a modified live that we're giving it because we have a lot of cows that are still because we have a fall and a spring herd and just for risk of giving something modified live to something that's currently pregnant, everything is getting a, a dead, dead vaccine. So All right. And I guess, you know, well, you have a cattle, other calves up in this barn. How do you take care of your manure management? How do you ensure that's properly done? Yeah, we do have a stack pad uh, that's attached to this. This was an old dairy barn. It was designed with manure management in mind. Um, because it's a solid substance, we can stack it on a concrete area. And honestly, we scrape off of the edge of the concrete, and the stack pad is below with a uh, sloped concrete area going into it so that we can load and unload out of it with the skid steer, okay. um, which works great for us. It's a very convenient uh, setup. We do want to make sure we try and do it at a drier time of the year just because there's some moisture that builds up and we just don't want something that coming in and out of Right, making it a challenge yeah, to get yeah, in and out of it. Because it, it is lower than the concrete, so if there is moisture, it, it does tend to stay a little bit wetter down there. But everything gets scraped. So our calves came out at the beginning of March, Everything got scraped. The barn got rebedded. We use usually a poor quality bale of hay, uh, or if we have a bale of straw or something like that, we would use that as well. And we'll bed now and then again. If we have a lot of rainfall, we'll bed another time inside the barn just to give them something more solid to so to lay on. Everybody has a decent place to lie. Yep. I've never had any real issues with tagging, but I will say that this was a barn designed for 50 to 60 head of cow. Of dairy cow and i never i've never felt comfortable putting more than 60 head of feeders into a barn list size okay um just because i don't do daily scraping on my concrete areas and i don't like a buildup of manure so that is sort of our based upon the hay feeding spaces that we have as well as the bunk space for getting calves on our maximum number in the barn is 60 but our group sizes of cows are around 50 fall and spring so 42 in there right now. Okay. We could potentially get up to 50, depending on how large our cow herd ends up being. So, you know, with those calves in the barn, what's your frequency? Of uh, we would scrape our concrete areas. It, in the wetter parts of winter, we scrape once a week. Right now, as it gets into spring and summer, we can probably get away with about two weeks on a scrape because... Quite honestly, one, the calves are younger right now and they're Small. not building up as much manure. And two, it dries out. And I don't mind a little bit of dry manure on the ground. It, honestly, the it is scored concrete, so it's comfortable for the cattle to walk on. But a little bit of manure doesn't hurt my feelings in terms of making the ground more stable for those animals. Um, okay. I also wouldn't necessarily recommend people put these young animals on concrete and never let them off till they finish them. But... It certainly works for the first few weeks, and then we give them a sacrifice lot as well. Yeah. And once they get out in the sacrifice lot, which we can use a lot more in the summer and late spring when it gets drier, that even extends further how long we can keep scraping. So I would say at least every two to three weeks, but it depends a little bit on the weather. Okay. Really, and most of these calves, what do you what do you do with your little heifer calves? Do you keep them, or are you trying to sell them? 
Um, so we will do both. We will, one of the benefits of bringing them in as a barn, um, I know you do your weights too, but we will weigh everything as it comes in the barn. We'll weigh again at a month and then we'll weigh again another time, most likely, depending on how long we hold animals over. Um, we already know sort of which heifers we like or which cows we like. And if we've got heifers coming out of cows, we like that makes them more likely to be a keeper obviously but is it just on phenotype or is it just on that weight gain both or both it'll okay. be a little bit of both uh, so we're going to look for structural um issues with some of our animals um we don't want any of that obviously uh we're going to look at performance of the mother for the last couple of years and then we're going to look at that calf's performance on feed you know, the calf performance is both an indicator of how the calf is doing and how the cow did. If we have animals that are showing very clear compensatory gain, huge gains in the first month or months or six weeks, we know that that animal came from a cow that probably didn't have a good milk supply because mm. we haven't creep fed. Yeah. Um, we may change that style as we get more information on our cows, but because we grew our herd aggressively and we purchased cows that came in and we didn't have internal data on them um we're using the decisions on these calves to make decisions about cows but also it helps us make decisions about which heifers we're going to keep okay and i guess so you're trying to get rid of the, like, the bottom 10 percent or the i guess i know there's probably minimum weight maybe 300 400 pounds i guess for you at sure weaning. yeah so we would we certainly don't want to keep anything that's weaning calves that are less than 300 pounds that's a, that's a hard no for us i wouldn't really want to keep a lot of calves under 400 pounds unless they maybe came out of a heifer um right that that is still a little bit up for debate um in the spring herds i'd want an even heavier weight but over the winter period where i'm not feeding feed the cows are getting some feed but the feed is is being used by the cows the the calves are not really getting access to feed until they wean I mean, they can come up and clean out the troughs after the cows have finished eating, but the cows are much bigger and more aggressive about getting that feed, and there's not a huge amount in front of them, only a couple pounds a day. So these calves have really not seen any feed at all at this point, to be fair. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I wouldn't guess that that's... And I get, you know, you mentioned that compensatory gain, mm -hmm. I guess, with low performance, so they, they have the genetic potential, then they get that compensatory gain. Yep. Uh, what what type of gain? What kind of difference are you seeing? Is it a hundred pound difference, fifty pound, or is it just a a smaller? In terms of the gain over the first couple of months, gain, the first it, couple no, months. it'll be. So we usually do our gain as a, a rate of gain per day. You know, we target two pounds a gain a day. That's that's our target when we're feeding our animals with better quality hay and the feed, and we work with our our local feed company and give them our hay tests and then they can help us meet the needs of the animals to hit that two pound they target. In. We don't want more than two pounds because we do keep heifers and we're mm -hmm. not trying to make really fat heifers that aren't going to breed. That's not our goal. Um, but we also want to make sure we're getting enough gain on the male calves and the females that we're selling that when they go onto a heavier diet where they're pushing for gain more than we do, that we aren't leaving them in a position where they're not able to handle their, rumen and their digestive tract isn't able to handle a higher grain diet. So that's sort of where we sort of sit on that grain scale. We're looking for that two pounds. Okay. If we see an animal that's at two six or two eight, uh one of two things. Either they started heavy and they're just a really efficient, good animal and they are also really good at eating out of a trough. Yep. Or they started out light and they're gaining like that. And that's compensatory gain in my opinion. Generally, if we see them, you know, below one six, concern that they're just not, they're either not aggressive enough to eat from the trough or there's some genetic issues with the mother or the father that are causing that. You know, if we have a heifer bull, we might allow that that bull just doesn't have the growth that our typical terminal sires would have. But for the most part, if I'm seeing anything under one six, I'm tagging that as a heifer not to keep and I'm also tagging that mother with a concern. So, I guess, uh, you know, if you have maybe for your, your calves, they're going to be smaller. Would a first calf heifer, you know, are you breeding them for low birth weight bulls? Are you maybe seeing a little smaller weaning yes. weights? Because there is, you know, correlation. 
yeah, so we will we will have lighter weaning weights on our heifer calves, calves that came out of a heifer because we do use a heifer bull. Yes. Um, and that bull is, uh, at this point, we have a shorthorn bull. And that is a small bull. He's never going to even, I don't think he's ever going to hit a ton. He's, he's tiny. Uh, and we inherently chose that because we want to guarantee that we don't have to pull calves. Right. Um, that is not what I would want genetically for my cow herd, though. Uh, the cow herd has more terminal sires with much better growth potential. So that's why I watch the rate of gain for those animals. They might not hit a full two pounds if they came out of that shorthorn bull. But if they're not hitting one six, then there's something wrong. Because we have enough feed and, and hay in front of them. They should be they able, should to be able to still function. hit into that range around two reasonably. Okay. Very good information here. I don't know if these are the right numbers. I don't know that they will work <laughs> for other people. I'm not recommending people go out and make decisions based upon how I do. But but I do think it helps to sort of see how people approach it. I do think putting a gain per day on those animals... And also interesting to see is which animals have a gain per day in that first month and how much. We've had some groups come in the barn and they start and they have two pounds of gain a day from day one to day 30, which oh. means that they don't really regress back very aggressively with weaning, which is excellent to see. Uh, but we have other years where they only hit one five for the first month and then it's only in the second month that we actually see that two pound. Um, and that's probably a little bit about how those animals handled weaning as well as how that quality of hay was. Um, some, of the, some of them really are very good at eating hay, and the fall group in particular tends to be really good. Even if they don't eat feed great for the first week or two, they eat hay really well. And if we bumped up the quality of hay, they will actually maintain or gain slightly just because. Well. Probably some of it's just environmental factors, you know, weather-wise sure. and you know, year-to-year -year variation. Yep, I think so we, too. That we see as well. Well, I mean, everybody's going to do different you know, weaning wise, and I'll, I'll be a little different from you and even other producers here in the department probably would be different as well. Absolutely. It's just, everybody has their own way of managing. Yeah. It's always interesting to see how people make decisions and what data they use to make it. But you and I are both big proponents of, of getting weights and sort of managing that. So that's always sort of exciting to see how people collect that data and then utilize it. Yep, and I think, you know, weights, when they're bought and sold on a weight basis, that's the one thing I always harp on. It's like, that's what we have to know is the weight. Of the Absolutely. So I think, I think that's probably a pretty good summary of, of weaning into a barn. And for me, the, the real benefit is that, you know, I have a pretty huge labor savings in how I distribute my feed. I don't have to carry buckets. Yep. Um, as well, I have an, a concrete pad to unroll my hay so that I don't have any hay wastage with I have minimal hay wastage. Minimal. There's always going to be some. I don't want to <laughs> don't don't want to sell a system as something other they than lick, what it is. Lick the lick the clean. <laughs> yeah, they don't they don't lick it clean. There is always some wastage, but minimal wastage, especially if I do a good job putting it out. Uh, last night I had to do it with my son on the tractor and unroll it, and it was quite an experience. So uh, yep. But hopefully they eat it because I put it out there. <laughs> yeah, it's available for them to eat, and it still be will still will be there. Absolutely. It's actually pretty nice hay. It's got a lot of clover in it, so hopefully they take that up and get a little extra protein. There. But let's talk a little bit about what you're, what's happening on the farm in the next week, what the goals are before we come back here and do another podcast, and then we can tell people what we really didn't get done. This week. <laughs> well, I guess for this week, what's going to be is we're hoping to get our manure spreader back from the shop as well. So you know, maybe potentially trying to spread a little bit of manure out there, take advantage of some of that phosphorus and potassium in there, a little bit of nitrogen, and put it back on the fields, and probably and technically reseed a bit of the clover as well with that. Um, and, and still doing some repairs, got to replace some belts on our baler still, and and work on a valve. So a couple little things, and and still just doing a lot of maintenance and making sure our calves are still growing well. So probably just putting some eyeballs on the calves, run them around, see which ones are going to be phenotypically speaking preferred, and uh, potentially for those. Uh, retaining heifers that sounds like a pretty busy week actually uh so we've got uh working those calves most likely on the agenda um as well we have a couple tires we need to handle some issues with them so we've got still working on the rims well we have one rim that hasn't come in yet to the at least i haven't i haven't heard from this shop that it's made it in the special orders take a little bit longer um, and the other one uh, is a larger tire that just needs to go to a specific tire shop to get re-heated. 
Okay. Um, and it's just one that can't be done at our local tire shop, so it just takes a little bit longer. I've got to drive up to your neck of the woods in Harrodsburg to get it. It's, uh, okay. Hopefully we get a couple of those things done, because that would make the manure spreader viable, as well as our trailer, our cattle trailer, which both of which need to be viable in the short term. In the short but term, yeah. Hopefully we can get a couple of those things knocked out, but that is somewhat dependent upon both time and supply chains. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, we'll it's... see. But other than that, we certainly are still feeding hay. I don't think anything is going off of hay this week. So we'll be a little bit busy with that. And more calving, both of us. And more calving. Uh, my calf watch is now at 2 of 35. Where's yours? Oh, we are at 2. You're so at 2 also? We're at 2 also. Okay, so. next week we'll do a calf watch update and <laughs> tell you how many calves we have on the ground, because hopefully it's more than 2. If not, we've had a major dip in production. <laughs> yeah, yeah. most of ours, we actually, you know, we're calving later here just because we, we got burned five or six years ago by the big snowstorm in March, so... Not doing that again. Yeah, it was near perfect. We were expecting a March 20th start date, and, and we had two calves yesterday. So that's oh, yeah. nearly spot on for us. With It means the bulls went in and they started working right away. So with that, we'll see you guys uh, next week with another podcast. All right, take care. Have You Heard is a production of the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture, Food, and Environment along with the Department of Biosystems and Agricultural Engineering. Discover what's wildly possible at ca.uky.edu.